let's talk a little bit about some of the concrete ways that we can expand learner choices. You heard me talk in the keynote about using our design thinking to talk about expanding choice. What does that actually mean? There are two things in front of you. If you didn't get the handouts, um, put a, please put a hand up. We've got them floating around. Oh, lots of folks. Uh, whoever has the handouts, uh, please float these around. We've got one handout. If you don't mind if I'll borrow yours for a second, please. Thank you. One handout has a whole bunch of questions that we won't answer in this workshop. This is meant to be for after. This is going to be something that I'll ask you in the privacy of your own thoughts. Please think about the strategies that you want to do with your own learners and in your own design. There's also a rating form here. Um, this is just for me. I really do want to hear how this time goes for you. If you do want to save yourself time at the end of the workshop, just circle all the fives now and you'll be done. <laughs> so, awesome. So let's dig in on parts of universal design for learning that increase learner choices, that help your students to stay more engaged. And before we start off with accountability, I want to ask you a question, and I want to ask you if you'll make me a promise. At the end of this workshop, if you have one thing that you're going to do, would you please post that thought somewhere? If you're on Twitter, we've got a hashtag for the conference, which is U-S-U-E-T-E. -E. And I'm there. I'm Thomas J. Tobin. That's my handle. But I'd like to ask you, if you have one thing you're going to do, please let the university know and let me know. Because I'm a cheerleader for all of the things you folks do. There was an excellent question from one of my colleagues down here before we started. And the question ran along the lines of, do we need to know like a different universal design for learning if we're teaching undergraduates versus graduate students? And forgive me if I'm mangling the question. And the answer is no, not really. Because universal design for learning, if you go to cast.org, you'll see that UDL is a framework. It's a mental model of how we structure the interactions that we have with our learners. And we don't even have to be in formal learning experiences in order to apply universal design for learning. When we're doing outreach to the community, I had a chance to talk to many faculty members who in addition to their faculty roles are working on community outreach. If we're librarians working with learners and faculty members, support staffers, media services folks, anybody who interacts with faculty members, then we have an opportunity to design those interactions in ways that give people choices about how they do them. If you work in the registrar's office, one of the most powerful things you can do is at the beginning of every semester, you have a line that snakes along through a long open space before people hit the the registrar's counter, put up signs that tell people what they're going to need at the counter, right at the front of the line, and also have a little tiny video playing on an iPad that tells them the same thing. Some people will listen, some people will read, more people will be prepared by the time they're ready to talk to the registrar's desk folks. So okay, first off, here is a thought exercise. We're going to go through a few different pieces of universal design for learning and I'd like for you to take some notes. If you have that piece of paper with the questions on it, that's great. If you have another piece that's your own, even better. But accountability. How do you ask your students to be accountable for the learning that they are doing in your specific class? What do you do right now that makes sure that your students are actually going to do the work. Ticket to class. Say again? I do ticket to class. Ticket to class? So they had an assignment. They get a quick assignment that proves they did their reading before they even walked in the door. Ah, okay. So a quick assignment that proves they did the reading 
before they even walk in the door for the face-to-face -face, uh, face -face session. Excellent. Other accountability strategies. I teach a Photoshop graphic design course, so I solicit graphic design opportunities from businesses in the community, and my students have to choose among those experiences, and the report comes back from the community saying, mm. yes, the student so, did it, it's great. So an authentic learning accountability mechanism where this professor asks people out in the community to say, here's my need for this graphic design. Hey, students, can you help this business or that business? And then who, who gives part of the grade? The people being helped. Excellent. We teach nursing, and so we use simulation so to see if they can actually. Oh, accountability. Can you actually perform these tasks? And uh, in my, I love my nursing folks because they are our professional skeptics, right? <laughs> and I say this with love. My mom is a nurse because they don't want to adopt any strategy unless it's already been tested and other people have done it and they know that it works. <laughs> they are my second favorite people on campus. I won't tell you who the first are. <laughs> <laughs> and so making sure that people can go through a simulation before they get into a situation where it counts. Now, in nursing, where it counts is you could do bodily injury to someone else. So that's a real clear-cut line. But in terms of accountability, one of the strategies for universal design for learning is giving people a lot of opportunity to practice where it's not graded. Here is a radical suggestion. Grade less. I mean radically grade less. One of the challenges for most of us is we came up in an educational system where we had to get it right the first time or we were failing, right? Absolutely, we're talking about the difference between formative and summative assessment. Hang on just a sec. And so if you are teaching a course in whatever subject, whether it's practical and hands-on or more theory-based, come on down, we've got two seats for you right here. And whatever course you're teaching, if you are grading everybody's weekly quizzes, that is, I will suggest, a waste of your time most of the time. You as the professor, as the instructor, you can be doing better things with your time. Now, the ticket to class idea, you can check off, did the students actually do the weekly quiz? and then give them correct answers for the quiz and tell them, if your answer doesn't match mine, call me. Talk to me in class. Shout it out in class. That turns an assessment into an opportunity for learning. So grade less is an excellent accountability strategy. Learner progress. Up on the screen you see a bunch of Jawa. You remember these guys from the Star Wars movie? They're about this tall, they're in brown robes, you can't see their face, they have red glowing eyes, and they sound like this. Woo, what do you need? Those guys. And they're the scavengers of the Star Wars universe, and here they are in their workshop putting together a bunch of droids so that they can resell them. So when we talk about learner progress, how do students know how they are doing in your class on day three? week two, midterm, and throughout the course. How do they know how they're doing? Gesundheit. Assessments. Assessments and tests. Such as? Well, we require for the <coughs> test in the course and then a final. And that kind of assesses how well they went in test. Okay. And it's boring. And they hate it. So there's... Um, can anybody help our colleague out? She says we have like four tests and then a final and it's kind of boring and it's very much, here's the material, did you know it? Here's the material, did you know it? Can anybody help? Down here and then over here. I, in my class I got rid of tests and instead we use our LMS system to converse as a class. That, that uh, makes it so that they're hearing more than just my voice and 
I, I follow the conversations, and if somebody's struggling, then I'll personally email them a note saying, <laughs> here's some ideas that you can use to better synthesize what we're doing. Now, now wait, wait, forgive me for saying this, but what? Yep. He got rid of tests? Yep. How do you know how they're doing? He right. said, setting him up. <laughs> By their conversations, as they discussed the material that they went through during the week. It, if I'm reading between the lines then, even if you have to give tests that measure a particular body of knowledge. Some of us teach in disciplines where there's many different ways to show your skill. Some of us teach in disciplines where there's only one. And there's a right way and a not right way to do things. So if you're offering students that practice opportunity, but also showing them how they're progressing through. And I actually didn't hear if a student knows how he or she is progressing. So let's go to some other folks here who had some ideas. Please. I put my colleague on the spot. Um, she actually does a process called Kahoot. K-A-H-O-O-T, Kahoot. Yeah, and it's, Tell us about it. It's really interesting because the students then come to my classes and I don't have time to do Kahoot most of the time. But they're studying things that they need to learn and then that gives them an opportunity to all buzz in together and then they can realize if they got that wrong, why they got it wrong, or she can go into more depth because of the factor that all, all people miss that one particular. So using, using a response system that students use their mobile phones to give anonymous responses to study questions or conversation in a way that isn't graded yet, but they can still see, oh, I've got it, I'm strong in this, I might need to study on that. There was another comment here. I use case studies a lot for nursing here, but we, I can teach where exam, I may only have 40 questions, and I'm pinpointing just really brief things that case study, I can look at a whole interactive process and see how their thinking is happening to get to the answers they're getting to. So uh, using case studies so that students can see immediately, oh, I understand this case, I know how to respond to it, I see how my colleagues are responding to it. This is all excellent. Let's talk about universal design for learning in light of all of these. And are those helpful responses for you? And the one thing we've done too in nursing is they, we require them to take the individual test. Then we do collaborative tests. They get together in groups that we assign and they take the test again but there's five or six of them taking it, and they have very good discussions on which is the right answer. So doing an individual test that's for a grade, and then afterwards getting five or six people together to do a collaborative retest, mm -hmm. and then they argue over, well, this is why I chose that, or this, or why is this the correct way to do, or not. And I actually let them use their textbooks, their lecture notes, everything. Be because in the, and allowing them to use resources because in the real world, it's where do you find the information, not what's in your brain. Do we have any mathematicians in the audience? Does this work in math? I heard yip. Can you expand on that, please? <laughs> so in, in my math class, when I, when I teach, I actually give my test collaboratively. They can work mm -hmm. groups in together. But uh, the way that I structured my test um, it's more look, it's looking more at the, the concepts uh, and the creation of the concepts rather than just an algorithmic skill rather than just saying compute this. Hmm. It's it's a process of um, you know how how are these things related and explain this relationship and explain why this is true why this isn't true why does this work why doesn't it work and I, I allow them to work in groups so that they can collaborate but then I say okay after your collaboration's done then I want you to go and write your own response. Mm -hmm. And, and that way I can kind of see what they're, what they're understanding. So, Excellent response. Let me see if I can paraphrase. Um, our math professor here, instead of saying to students, here is the problem, now go find the right answer, he's giving problem sets that are here, are, here are the pieces that go into it, here's the process to take, work together to figure out the way to put this together. And then, after you've collaborated, create your own individual response. Did I paraphrase well? Awesome. I see other ideas here, and forgive me for just a second, because this gentleman helped us to move from learner progress. And this is all about signposting. A good plus one way to do this is to tell students, uh, anybody 
serve in the military? We've got a few folks. Awesome. Then those people in the room will know what I'm saying when I say first we tell them what we're going to tell them, then we tell them, then we tell them what we've told them. Give students information about their progress so that they see what's coming up, so that they know what they're doing now, and they see how it connects to what comes next. This can be as simple as using the announcements or news feature in the learning management system to say, it's week three. By now, you should have done these six things. If you didn't do these six things, call me right away. We're going to work on these two things this week. And that's going to set you up for these things later on. This is the why of learning. And it helps students with their time management, executive function, and learning process. Also, if you can give them that information and that encouragement and that engagement in more than one way. So if you create that lovely news item, grab your cell phone camera. It doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, students kind of like it better when it's just you, you know, in your office. Hi, I'm Professor Tom, and here's what you should have done by now, and here's what we're going to talk about now. It'll take you two minutes and post that video along with. Now, do you need technology to do universal design for learning? No. Does technology that's in everybody's pockets help? Heck, yes. In fact, our mathematics colleague down in front actually, and are you OK with a high five? Unknowingly slid us right into response to instruction. Here is where uh, one of the pieces of universal design for learning, where we're talking about giving students more than one way to demonstrate their skills, this is where it is very different for people in grade school, middle school, high school, undergraduate, graduate studies, and for people in different disciplines. But if we think about plus one design, how do you know that your students are paying attention to you when you talk to them in your learning interactions? Notice I never said the word lecture. <laughs> How do you know that your students are paying attention to your modeling when you are teaching? How do you know? Engaged. They're engaged. Um, somebody paying attention, we pause for discussions. Awesome. How else? How else? They have to do competency-based education in my class. Ooh, CBE. So competency-based education. We have a colleague here who is designing her interactions around particular demonstrations of discrete skills. And can you do the skill? Yes, you pass. Can you not do the skill? Keep at it. Let me make the question even simpler. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to worry our cameraman, but it's OK. <laughs> I'm going to look at everybody's screens for just a second. Taking notes, taking notes, taking notes, checking Facebook, taking notes, taking notes, taking notes, ordering my book, awesome. <laughs> no, I, I completely made up a couple of those. But I did actually see lots of people taking notes. And so the, the simple question is, how do you know your students are engaged? Yes. No. Absolutely. Get meta with your students. Ask your students. I'm going to be talking about a difficult concept. What's the thing that would help you to pay attention, to study, to get the concept? Have other professors done things that worked for you? Here is a secret that your LMS people will never tell you. 
The most powerful tool in the learning management system is the survey tool. Give your students a two question survey. Make it anonymous. And one question is closed ended. It has choices to it. For example, how much of the reading are you actually able to accomplish every week? 0%, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100%. You will know very quickly how, the, how your class stacks up. And the second question is open-ended. Why did you answer the last question the way you, an you answered it? And you will get, I'm working two jobs. I'm taking care of my family. Um, I just went, I, it just happened. I went out and I partied too much. I'm sorry, professor. I mean, you'll get honest responses. But then you can actually take action. And it doesn't have to be about the reading. These little two question quizzes, response to instruction, give your students a voice. How can you tell they're paying attention? <laughs> ask them. <laughs> and ask them in more than one way. You notice if I did that verbally here with everybody, people would be like, yeah, we're paying attention. Uh-huh, right. Mm -hmm. Is anybody looking at me? Right? Your students have that same self-consciousness. Give them an opportunity to let you know something honest in the feedback in an anonymous way and then respond to it. They're going to hear you as being a much more concerned professor. I've got a comment here and then in the back. Well, one of the things I noticed with you in particular, and this is how I figure out what, they're, what they've got on the learning devices, is I move. I don't stay in one place. Like, you know, when you go into the lecture thing and you don't move. And you're just droning. Yeah, people, if you turn to page 78 in your books, and uh, I'll just stay up here and talk to you, and so on and so forth. Now, I, I'll, I'll agree with the gentleman in front that moving around in a physical classroom is a great way to sort of take the temperature. But I usually don't do that a lot for that reason. Mm -hmm. I move around because I'm French Canadian, and I talk with my hands, and I can't really sit still. But I won't spit on you. I've, 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 I also have pretty good hearing. So. But I, the reason I move around is I like to interact and engage with folks. But even when I'm teaching fully online, I want to give my students an opportunity that I trust them. Um, if you were actually on Facebook, that's OK. As long as you're not disturbing everyone else in the class, I'm all right with that. I don't mind. It's, you're, you're an adult. You've got, you've got your own deal. We've got time for a comment here and then here, and then we're going to move it ahead just because of time. Excellent. And we often teach courses as though there is some special body of knowledge that people can get at in one way and then learn. But in a language course, if you're not participating, you're not really there. Absolutely. Right? And so if, but if there's more than one way, I'll challenge you to think in a UDL perspective here. If there's more than one way for your students to demonstrate that presence, so if you have somebody who is painfully shy and is not going to speak up in a public way, um, offer your students the opportunity to ask questions verbally or write them down on an index card and pass them to the front, which you probably do. Awesome. And one more comment here. I, I think oh. that's why, sorry. No, that's you. I think that's why formative assessment is so important because one student may be sitting there and like never you. take a note for the entire semester and another student may sit there and take you know, excessive notes and maybe they are getting still different levels out of that where someone can just remember everything that they hear. So with the formative assessments, like many people have already said, that's how you know, are they learning, are they engaged, are they following along, do they get what's going on here? Yeah, and you still do have to have some standards that you have for this person passed and this person did not. So I don't want to say throw out all kinds of assessment, 
But I do want to say design for learner variability. And are you okay with a high five? I'm going to have to stretch for this, but let's do it. Awesome, because I, I love how you're just leading into the next thing. You guys are thinking through very well. Design for learner variability. Up on the screen, you see characters from all over the Star Wars universe. There's also a Doctor Who character in there. If you spot that person, you're a nerd's nerd. <laughs> so, but before you start looking at the screen too much, our students are not, and they never were, a homogeneous, all the same group of people. They come to us with different levels of preparation, oftentimes because of their socioeconomic circumstances, where they were born determined which schools they went to. They come to us with varying levels of thought speed. I'm a firm believer that anyone can learn anything, but not in the time we have to give them. And I'm also a firm believer that our learner variability, we can design our interactions so that we assume people are going to need information in more than one way. People are going to demonstrate their skills in more than one way. If you're going back and retrofitting an existing class, this is the most powerful thing. I talked about this several times. I actually want to underline it. Think about the interactions that happen in your class and think about where your students interact with the materials. That's the easy one, actually. But then how do they interact with one another? Interact with us as the instructor. And our, our uh, Photoshop professor talked about interacting with the wider world, getting out to talk with members of the community and involving them in assessment and those kinds of things. There was a comment up top, and then we'll come down front. Homogeneity, the sameness of things, yeah. Would you, would, you, would you forgive me if I take a minute here? Can I do a little myth busting with everybody? You've heard of the VAK uh, idea, visual, auditory, kinesthetic learners, right? People are visual learners, so they need text. People are auditory learners, so they need to hear it. Um, can I say crap? <laughs> That's crap. We've known about that for 25 years, that psycho psychologists and neurologists have figured out that there is no such thing as a visual learner. I hate to burst your bubble if this is how you've been teaching for a long time, but that is not supported by the science. Now, people don't have learning styles. Because if I'm a visual learner most of the time, does that mean I cannot learn by hearing things? Of course not. We have learning preferences, and they change from moment to moment. And if we design for variability, we are making it so that people can make their choices in the moment of need. And oftentimes it's not, oh, I'm a visual learner, I need to see it. It's, oh, I'm on the bus so I can't read it, so I better put my headphones in. Sometimes the circumstances dictate our learning preferences. So we should design for that variability. And that leads us into construct relevance. This is, are we actually grading our students on the things that we want them to demonstrate? And are we grading them on things that we don't care about too? Here's an example. In a mathematics class, we might give students uh, in an introductory uh, trigonometry course, we might give them some word problems. And the word problems might, be, might use language that people didn't recognize from where they grew up. Or they might have words in there that they don't understand. Um, the SATs four years ago 
were forced to re remove and rewrite hundreds of questions because they were implicitly biased in favor of young, white, affluent males. And some of you remember this story. And so they talked about, uh, one of the word problems was about, you know, uh, I don't want to say like Biff and Charlie on their yacht, but it was Biff and Charlie on their yacht. <laughs> you know, and if you've got folks who are coming from a different socioeconomic place, you're now grading them not on their math skills, but on their skills of social comprehension, reading comprehension, and being able to understand the problems. So if you can give students even a choice among different word problems, you're already working in a plus one way. Please comment. In nursing, you know, our big problem is content and information overload. Oh, yeah. And so we talk about need to know, nice to know, nuts to know. <laughs> let, me rephrase, let me say that again for the rest of the room. Need to know, nice to know, nuts to know. I'm interested in the third one, but we're going to move on. Multiple means of action and expression. This is the powerful one we talked about in the keynote. How do you give your students choices in how they demonstrate their skills, whether that's on a final assessment or if it's on the drafts? Let's take three examples here. People, if you haven't put a hand up, now's your time. What's one thing you do that gives your students a choice about how they demonstrate their skills, whether it's practice or it's final? I'm teaching uh, sociological theory. Mm -hmm. So in your sociological theory class, you let students choose and add a movie and expression of that particular, uh, particular topic, and then they have to follow your rubric for explaining why it demonstrates this particular theory or idea. Am I right? Awesome. What's another way that you offer students that choice? Please. Um, so I teach teachers how um, to teach kids in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in your, in your class, you actually offer some open-ended stuff, which is you can sing it out, you can dance it out, you can do what have you. Again, I'll encourage everybody, don't go as crazy as this professor, <laughs> at least not at first. Plus one is the way to keep it within manageable boundaries. We'll take one more, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, one of the assignments that I have, um, I teach in the comedy department, the communicative disorders department, and we try to have our students develop empathy for the types of clients that they're going to be working with. And so we have experiential labs that they have to go out in the public and possibly stutter to an unfamiliar person in public. And I had a student a few years ago that was like, I am extremely, I have anxiety, I can't do this. So I found YouTube videos of individuals expressing how it is for them to stutter. And then I asked questions, when you listen to this individual share what it is like for them, how did that make you feel? Can I ask a real quick question? Um, the comment was she teaches a communication disorders class and she asks her students to go out and do experiments in public, like stuttering to people in public to see what the reactions are. And she had one student who said, I'm really painfully shy, I'm, I have anxiety, I'm not going to be able to do this. And she found YouTube videos of people explaining what it was like to be a stutterer and had made an alternative assessment for that student. I'd like to suggest that was one change, one time for one person. That's an accommodation. Did you also then change the assignment to open up those options for everybody? Yes. Can I get a high five? That's awesome. That's UDL. And there should be audio. We actually tested this earlier, and it's not playing. So you're about to hear, you have been well trained, my young apprentice. They will be no match for you. So now that you've come over to the dark side, and you know the structures behind it. We've just scratched the surface here today, and I'm really grateful that the examples all came from you. Think about the interactions you have with your learners. Start doing plus one with them, 
And I would love to hear what you do down the road. And I'll be a cheerleader for all of you folks. Thank you very much. Um, I want to, before we go, before we go, I want to give you a free book. My book on UDL is coming out on November 1st. If you're interested in that, come over to the uh, exhibit area later on today. I'll be over there at a table. I'd love to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with any of you. But this is the book that actually started it all. This is from CAST, and it is Universal Design for Learning, Theory and Practice. If you go to UDL Theory Practice, dot cast dot org. It's a mouthful. They'll ask you for your name and your email address only to fulfill the federal grant the book was published under. They don't sell it or do anything else with it. And then you will get the electronic version of the book which is better than the in print one because it's got all the multimedia, all the case studies, all the examples of how other people from K-12 all the way through graduate and professional school are actually doing it. So I'll give you a free book and I'll say thank you very much. This was awesome. Enjoy the rest of your day and the sessions. Thank you very much. <laughs>